oh boy, here comes another fiery hoop. Here comes another opportunity to show what I can do, to dance with the, with the big guns. To dance with the big guns? Is that a thing? High fidelity. So high fidelity was my big breakthrough role. I got that because John Cusack was a fan of my band Tenacious D. He thought I was funny and he thought I'd be good in, in the role. I was nervous about it because it was a movie about rock and roll and it was about people who worked at a record store and were kind of snobby and, and uh, had real strong opinions on what music was good and what was bad. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. I have a band. I really am a musician. I don't know if I want to make a movie about people criticizing music. Eventually, I realized I'd be an idiot to turn down this role. It's a great character. And uh, I took the plunge and uh, had the time of my life. The director, Stephen Frears, is uh, one of my all-time favorites to work with. I called him the warlock because he had the thick, juicy, bushy eyebrows. And he looked like he had magical powers. And he was grumpy. And uh, he would oftentimes lay on the ground and just look at the sky and say, I'm too old to be directing this movie. But then he would get up and he'd give me like the perfect piece of direction. And a lot of that movie was just adrenaline for me. I was just like, don't blow it, Jack. This is your big chance. So I came out of the gate windmilling, just acting as though my life depended on it. So the big finale of the movie, there's a concert and my character who's only criticized music and musicians the whole movie is finally up on stage and he has to actually perform. And there was a lot of talk about what song I was gonna sing. And one of the writers, D.V. DeVincentis, wanted me to sing that Marvin Gaye song. And I was like, why would I do that song? I mean, that song's a good song and everything, but I'd rather do like, a bigger, more iconic song, like, let's get it on. And uh, Cusack and Di Vicentes were like, let's get it on, dude, that's a big song. All right, if you think you can handle it. And I was like, I think I can handle it. <laughs> and then it came time to sing it and do the scene. And I did it, and the first take, I was a little trepidatious. I was a little, I was tiptoeing a little bit. I was a little cautious and, um, it definitely sucked. And uh, I'll never forget, Stephen Frears, the director, said, cut! And he got angry at everyone on the set, except for me. He didn't say anything to me. Extras, this is the finale of the film. Everyone on your feet, hard cheering excitement. Everyone, Jack, great job, let's do it again. And I was like, oh man. I know he's yelling at everyone else, but..." I think he meant to be yelling at me, but he didn't yell at me. Whatever it was, it gave me this crazy adrenaline goose. And uh, I came out in the second take swinging, and that's the one they used in the movie. And if you feel like I feel shit, come on. Let's go. Shallow how. After High Fidelity, I don't have to like send my headshot and resume around anymore. I start getting offers. One of the big offers I got was Shallow Hal to work with the legendary Fairley brothers who were coming off a unprecedented string of successes. You know, they had huge comedic blockbuster movies, Dumb and Dumber, all that stuff with Jim Carrey and with Ben Stiller. They had that huge hit, Something About Mary. So when they came a knocking, I said yes. And uh, yeah, found out that Gwyneth Paltrow was gonna be playing opposite me. So I was stoked, because I was a huge fan of hers, uh, not only as an Academy Award winning actress, but also I knew that she was funny as hell. I saw her on SNL just crushing it, and I was like, she's a real character actor. She's not just like a leading lady romantic interest. She's also like, a straight up badass when it comes to inhabiting different characters. And she really, you know, got inside that one, literally and figuratively, like emotionally, what it was like to be that person. And also she was inside of a suit that was like 
three times her size. Are you sure that's what you want to do? Coco! Coco! The cuckoo clock was mine. That was my own little spin on it. My, my little improvisation. Jason Alexander is in the movie as well, and he's on the Mount Rushmore of television comedy because of Seinfeld. Uh, one of the great blustering buffoons of television history. Uh, and it was uh, awesome to get a chance to go toe to toe with a legend. It was cool just hanging with him on the set. He had a lot of cool stories. But you know what was cool about the Fairley Brothers is uh, it was a really funny script and a funny story, but it had a lot uh, of um, uh, emotional underpinnings too, you know? It was about how we judge people by the way they look, and we don't really go beyond just their physical appearance. Uh, and it had some cool resonance in that way, and I think that's why it stuck around for all these years. People still compliment me on that movie, and I think that's why it struck a chord. Orange County. So I did this movie, Orange County, which, uh, among other things, was the first time I worked with Jake Kasdan, incredible director of Jumanji. Uh, the next level in Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. And I had such a blast working on that character. He's kind of a Jeff Sp Spicoli. Watch it, man. He's a stoner, and he's kind of a f up um, big brother to uh, Colin Hanks character. But um, it was a real blast to play because he's just sort of living life by the seat of his pants. You know, just uh, following his nose, and he's kind of a train wreck of a human being, but he's also kind of lovable, and it was a great character for me. Do you want me to call public safety? Do you want me to get naked and start the revolution? <laughs> uh, I had a lot of fun with it, and in, in that movie, I got to party with Colin Hanks, who's great. We had a great chemistry. What? Yeah, some cops are right on my ass. Now listen, I've been thinking about it. We are going to Mexico, buddy, right now. Oh, Lance. <laughs> I got to work with uh, Ben Stiller in a rad scene. What's your name? Uh, Joe. John. What uh, is it? Joe John. Name's Joe John? Johnston. Johnston. Joe. Yeah, everybody on the, in the cast and Jake were just incredible to work with. We're very proud of that movie. You're from Southern California, right? Did you channel any people that you knew to, to bring that character to life? I mean, it was just sort of an amalgamation of all the stoners that I knew growing up in Hermosa Beach. But no, no one in particular. Maybe weirdly closest to myself of all the characters I've ever played. School of Rock. So, I did Orange County, right? And Mike White wrote Orange County and Scott Rudin produced Orange County. And so Scott hatched this plan to, to give me the lead role in, uh, in a movie. And he was talking with Mike White about it. I'm like, what can we do? Because Jack's so funny in Orange County. What can we do that, that would really feature him as the central character? And Mike had this idea. He was like, I think he should be teaching kids uh, how to rock, and Scott Rudin said, go, write it. And Mike just told me, hey, uh, I've been hired to write a script for you, and uh, what do you think about this concept? And I was like, yes, do it, go. And he wrote this script, and I didn't tell him any, I didn't guide, give him any guidance or anything. I didn't really develop it at all. I just read his first draft was uh, dynamite. It was hilarious. Scott Rudin, the producer, said, I want you guys to meet this director, Richard Linklater. And I was like, I love Richard Linklater. I, I saw his film, uh, Slackers, which is this incredible, 
you know, bohemian movie about artists and eccentrics in Austin, Texas. And I was like, but that's such like an art film. I don't know if he's really the right director to direct a big, you know, studio comedy. But then we met him and I was like, oh, I get it. And that's kind of the genius of Scott Rudin, knowing who to put together to make magic happen. Because Linklater was taking it seriously and taking it to a, another level of like believability. He wanted everything to be rooted in, in reality and to believe that these characters are real and these kids are real and that this crazy scenario could have happened in real life. And that's the combination that made it special. And so he and Mike worked together on another draft and they worked, worked out the beats and we rehearsed it a lot. Richard is, is a theater guy at his core. That's his roots and, and me too. So I was super comfortable with that workshop and scenes with the kids and, and, and finding new beats. Like that scene where we're all going around the classroom and I'm assigning people their jobs and their musical instruments and we basically write a song in the room in one, in one scene without cutting. That was all workshop through rehearsal, you know, and added into the script. Oh, that's it. Okay, keep going with that, Zach. Do you remember this thing I taught you a minute ago? Go like... Yes! And a lot of the movie had that rad, like, malleable development feel to it. And uh, it's definitely, like, the movie I'm most proud of. That's the one that really, I felt like all the planets aligned. And when we did the first read through with the whole cast, it was just like, uh, it's just lightning in a bottle. And that's the only time I've, I've felt that I was like meant to do something. And now the rest is all just gravy. And I sing, I can die happy. <laughs> Got my school of rock. Did you pick a lot of the music that was in, that was used in the film? Um, yeah, everyone had their two cents, but I would say that, uh, Linklater had real strong opinions about certain jams. Yeah, he wanted that, that Zeppelin song uh, really badly. And uh, he's the one that said, hey, you know, I tried to get the Zeppelin music in Dazed and Confused, a movie that he directed before School of Rock. And they said no. So would you do me a favor and just make a video plea, just beg them to use the immigrant song that we ended up using the you know that that viking ah! and uh so i did i i begged them on video with a huge audience of extras in the in the movie theater that we were shooting in and uh they all chanted with me led zeppelin please bless us with your love i don't remember what i said it was ridiculous and off the top of my head and he sent it over there to them to England and it worked. They were like, oh, that's funny. That's funny, mate. Yeah, we'll, we'll let him use the song. That's not a very good imitation of Jimmy Page, but, um, and it's a great thing because it's one of, the, one of the best parts of the movie, that song. I was involved in a lot of the music. Any music that, that I sang that was like original music, I wrote or had a hand in writing. So the final song that you perform at the Battle of the Bands. That song is actually a band called Mooney Suzuki. And that was the song I was having real trouble writing. I was, I was trying to crack the code and I was like, there's too much pressure. It's the big finale song, the end of the movie. And uh, I wrote a bunch of different drafts and none of it was working. And then it was a, 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 a Saturday night and I went to see The Strokes. The band that opened was called The Mooney Suzuki. And they were so funny and hard rocking. And I was like, God. I wish I could write a song like that. That would be perfect for the end of the movie. And I went backstage after the show and I said, you guys, I loved your set. Um, 
I'm doing this movie called School of Rock. Would you want to take a crack at writing the finale song? I got some lyrics here that Mike White wrote. And they're like, yeah, man, I want to take a look at this. I'll, I'll give it a crack. I'll, I'll give you a text. I'll give you a text if I come up with something. I was like, all right, good luck. And I didn't have high hopes. The next day, I get the text with the, a rough of the song. And it just killed it, crushed. And I was so excited because I was like, we have the end of our movie. I think I might have cried a little bit. But that just goes to show like the stress and like the the last minute scrambling that can go into making a movie because we were already making the movie at that point. We didn't have the ending song. So it's crazy the kind of turmoil that you can put yourself through making these kind of some movies, but thank God we got it. Thank you, Mooney Suzuki. King Kong. So coming off of School of Rock, I was just like riding high on a cloud. I was like, things couldn't be better. I just like, had a home run of a movie that I'm super proud of and everybody seemed to love it. And uh, when my agent was like, what do you want to do now? What kind of movie you want to make? I was like, I don't know. She's like, who do you want to work with? And I was like, well, I just saw the Lord of the Rings trilogy and God, those movies are so good. If I could ever be in a Peter Jackson film, but I know that's never going to happen. And then like the next day, I get a call from my agent saying, dude, Peter Jackson wants you to be in King Kong. I was like, what? No. Really? And she said, yeah, you, you got to go meet him. I was like, well, I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to go meet him. I'm going to blow it. I'm going to say the wrong thing. And I went and met him, and they didn't want me to audition or anything. It, it was he and his wife and their writing partner. They just wanted to show me, like, uh, an animated uh, sort of uh, version of the end of the movie when King Kong is up on top of the Empire State Building fighting off the, 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 the airplanes, the bi-wing planes. And it was just a beautiful sequence. I got chills watching it. And uh, they said, so do you want to be in our movie? And I was like, yes, yes I do. So then we go off to uh, New Zealand and it's a long shoot. We're there for like six months, which is twice as long as a, as a normal movie because it's just huge and sprawling. And I was in heaven. Loved being in, in New Zealand, Wellington, New Zealand, beautiful country. Going to work every day, it was just, I didn't want it to end. Like when we got to the end of the shoot, I, I, I'm not ashamed to say I shed a couple man tears because I, I just wanted to live there and, and, and uh, never stop making King Kongs. So the huge scene where I'm fighting off all those prehistoric insects and disgusting flesh-eating bugs. Usually when you do a big special effects scene like that, they say very precisely, walk three steps and then swat at this tennis ball and then look up because another thing's coming. But this time, Peter Jackson was like, forget all of that. Just walk into this set and it looks like a disgusting prehistoric, like oozing landscape. And just pretend like there's literally thousands of man-eating bugs coming at you from every direction and just go off. Just be swatting around it for your life and we'll just add all the special effects later. And I was like, wow, okay. It was such freedom. I didn't have to worry about blocking. I just could let my imagination run wild. And that's basically what that scene is. We're all just like swatting at monsters in our, from our subconscious mind. It was really fun to shoot and incredible cardio. I'm gonna start a new exercise class called Killing Man-Eating Bugs. Nacho Libre. So Nacho Libre was uh, an incredible opportunity to work with amazing filmmaker, Jared Hess. 
Uh, I was such a huge fan of Napoleon Dynamite. And uh, I got the call that he wanted to collaborate. And I said, okay, meet me at the top of the parking lot over at the Arclight Theater. So we met there. It was a weird place to meet. I don't know why I wanted to meet there. It's a nice view of the city. I thought it would be a good place for an epic power meeting, looking at the view of Los, the, the Los Angelino skyline. And he told me the idea of this guy that had two lives. One life that was just for the Lord, and this other secret life that he has where he just, he loves wrestling. But they, they, they can't coexist, you know. A man of the Lord cannot live a life of, you know, violence. So he, he's torn, his soul is torn. And uh, the way that he described the world was so funny and rich. I was worried though, I was like, dude, he's a Mexican character. I don't know if I should play that character. And he told me that he had a plan for that, was that my father was Swedish and my mother was Mexican and they, they, I was born in Mexico and I grew up there, but that's why I'm a gringo. I wouldn't have to, you know, do any of the things that would be considered spicy. So we dove in head first and just had a ball. And it was such a beautiful uh, location. We filmed all in, in uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. Hey, listen to me. Hey, mucho take it easy. I need your help. And I... Chance of a lifetime, but first I need a man. Get off me! Ah! Oh! So me and Hector start off as enemies, and uh, over the course of the film, we come become best friends. And also, we have uh, philosophical differences. I am a man of the Lord, and I believe in in God and faith. And he's a man of science. He only believes in science, but somehow we still work together to become one of the great wrestling tag teams of all time. I don't want to get paid to lose. I want to win! I do get a lot of people saying, get that corn out of my face. Get that corn out of my face! Chancho, let me borrow some sweats. That's another good one. And a lot of that is just imitating Jared Hess. The director has an incredible uh, talent at, at doing voices and character work himself. And I always told him, dude, you gotta be the star of a movie. You're so funny. And he has no interest in that. Doesn't want to get up in front of the camera, but it's one of the things that makes him such a great director. Even they say, they say you're never supposed to do it, but he gives the best line readings. And sometimes I would even say, let me hear how you would say it. And he would say it and I would just bust a gut laughing so hard. Um, he made it really easy. I recommend working with Jared if you want a really, hilarious performance. And I really worked my ass off learning how to wrestle. It wasn't without injuries. I, I uh, at one point, sustained a, a bad gash on my eye, diving out of the ring, and I hit my head on some of those folding chairs, and I had to re be rushed to the, the hospital. And the producer <clears throat> said, hey, he's an actor. He's gotta be able to use his face. Let's not just get a surgeon, let's get the best plastic surgeon in Mexico over here as soon as possible. And this incredible plastic surgeon came to the hospital and she was dressed in a full ball gown. She had come straight from like a fancy event where she was in a ball gown and she did the surgery on my eye. And as, as you can see, she did incredible work. You can barely see it. Can't see it really at all. Yeah, thank you wherever you are, incredible surgeon. Tenacious D in the pick of destiny. Well, you know, my whole career kind of got jump-started by Tenacious D, because that's how I got High Fidelity, my big breakthrough role. And uh, I always 
got a special satisfaction out of doing Tenacious D because it was the it was the one job that I had where I was the writer, director, you know, auteur of the project. And uh, you got a special source of pride with that because you're not just a puppet in someone else's game. Even though, you know, all movies are a little collaborative and you get to put your two cents in, Tenacious D was my baby, you know. So uh, even while my career was taking off and I was getting all these big Hollywood movie roles, I always kept the burner going for Tenacious D and in between movies, working with Kyle on new material and new songs. And we realized <clears throat> that we were at a crossroads. It was time to take it to the next level. Oh! We had already done a TV series, a little limited HBO series. We did our, our big album and it was time to make Tenacious D the movie. And we worked really hard on, on writing that story and we we're like, hey, should, what should it, it just be like another weird adventure of Tenacious D or what? And we realized, no, it had to be the origin story of Tenacious D, where did we come from? And it had to be the true story of exactly the way it went down with some extra details to make it more exciting. Like we never actually met Satan at a crossroads, but we had to put that in there to make it, give it a little extra rocket sauce. Ah! Yeah, it was magical. We got everyone we wanted. I wanted Meatloaf to play my dad. We wanted Ronnie James Dio to be in there to be my inspiration. We got Tim Robbins to play the creepy stranger. Uh, everybody that we asked said yes. And we made the exact movie we wanted to make. We made a kick-ass theme song music video to promote the movie. When we went on SNL, we did everything you could do, and then the movie came out and nobody went to see it. And we were devastated. But we were still proud of the movie, you know? And over the years, it's been like, what has it been like? 12 years now, 13 years? Mm -hmm. People still come up to us and tell us how much they love the movie. And when we play concerts all around the world to thousands of people, they all know every word of the songs from The Pick of Destiny. So it really has sort of built a cult following over the years. Just because something doesn't get, you know, 100% on Rotten Tomatoes and zero people go to see your movie, doesn't mean that it has to be the end of the story. Uh, if you, if you love the, the work, that's all that really matters because it can find an audience further down the road. The Holiday. So I had done Nacho, The Pick of Destiny, King Kong, and then I got this offer for this movie that was a lot different in tone. It's like softer, it was sweeter. It was a, it was a romantic comedy, but it was really well written. And I was like, oh, you know what? My mom's gonna love this one. And it was also an opportunity to work with Kate Blanchett. No, sorry. Kate, Kate, hold on a second. And it was also an opportunity to work with Kate Winslet, the great. Not to be confused with any other Kate. Winslet. And I was like, wait a second. This isn't really gonna happen. Kate Winslet's not gonna do a movie with me. She's gonna go from Leonardo DiCap to Jackety McBlackety? And yes, she was. <laughs> hey, I got you the best drink in town, but I didn't know if you liked a little dollop of whipped cream or a big dollop, so I got both, and you can have each one. Whoa, hello, big dollop. <laughs> hey, you look great, by the way. Thanks. Really great. Thanks, I'm feeling good. I've been working out with Arthur. <laughs> what? No, I'm sure it's an awesome workout. I'm sorry, I'm trying not to picture it. Okay, well the workout's not that great with the corsets. <laughs> Stop laughing. I was the big winner there, because just getting to be in a movie with her and cameras are rolling and I'm looking across at one of the best actors living and in her eyes are the reality of the character and she's just like a pro on another level. So I learned a lot just from like doing scenes with her and watching her and how committed she was and how real she was. I mean, that's not really something you can learn. You can't learn to be charismatic like that. You gotta be born with it. But just her level of commitment was infectious and 
I felt like I, I picked up a lot of uh, a lot of that energy, you know. Tropic Thunder. So Tropic Thunder was a rad project that dropped in my lap. Ben Stiller was gonna do this big epic comedy out in Hawaii. It sounded like paradise. Show me where the drugs are. Don't judge me. The cast was intense. You got Danny McBride, but this is before Eastbound and Down. So people didn't really know what an incredible firecracker uh, of an artist he was yet. Just say no to this, you drug-making midget. And you got Robert Downey Jr., but this is before Iron Man. This is after his like scandal and it was like his career was over. So he was, he was on the comeback trail at that point. People didn't know he was about to explode and be the biggest superhero movie star in the world. There's a lot of people that were like getting ready to pop in that movie. You could feel it on the set. There was a lot of electric energy. The movie itself was groundbreaking in that it was super dark and funny and real. Like cinematography was Academy Award winning uh, level. There's a lot of things you had not seen before in, in, in a comedy. And it was hard. Comedies are supposed to be super easy, but dude, the locations were remote. You say, oh, you're filming in Hawaii. Oh, that must be really chill. That's probably paradise. But every day, dude, we had to get in a weird Jeep and drive over hill and dale, like really intense uh, landscapes, mud spraying, God, God, ah, for like an hour and a half to two hours every morning. You get out there and then get into your costume and makeup and, uh, and, and work, and we were like slogging, <laughs> screaming, bloody murder, hiking up mountains, and doing really intense scenes. But in the end of the, at the end of the day, it was worth it because it was funny as hell and really original. But the scenes that I remember the most are the ones where I fe felt like I was actually gonna die. I was on the back of a gigantic water buffalo at one point. Twin genie, twin genie. Child eat He's a fashion chicken failed up. It was carrying me around a mountain pass. We were on like our 13th take and I didn't blame the water buffalo because I'm, I'm heavy and it didn't want me on its back and it just started bucking. I was like, I want you off my back right now. And it started bucking Bronco. And I was like, oh, and they were like, cut, cut. And I was like, I can't stop him, ah! And I, he flew. I went flying, flip, ass over tea kettle, somehow miraculously landed between two big boulders. Uh, a little wind knocked out of me, but no lacerations, no injury, miracle. I should have died. And then uh, Ben still went, is everyone okay? Can we take it from the top, guys? And I was like, you, we're not taking it from the top. You get on the buffalo. And I just walked off the set. I thought justifiably. I didn't think I was a, being a diva at all. And then Ben realized, dude, I realized, I didn't know that you almost died. I didn't know what happened. I didn't see it. You weren't even on camera. I was like, it wasn't even on camera? Because when something like that happens, you want to know that at least you got some rad footage. No, it f***ing went off the road and the cameraman was like, no, this shot's not good over there. I keep the camera here. Those f***ing cinematographers never want to f*** their shot. No. Anyway, sore subject. Turns out, though, that water buffalo was pregnant. That's why it was freaking out. No one knew because she wasn't showing. And um, the baby's fine. Uh, and guess what they named it? Jack Black. Nice. So if you ever meet a, a, a big ass water buffalo named Jack Black, you'll know what's up. Jumanji, welcome to the jungle. Yeah, I love Jumanji, the original Jumanji with Robin Williams, Kirsten Dunst, and the rest. There on Jumanji Isle. Incredible movie. Incredible performance by Robin Williams because he thrived in characters and scenarios that were extreme. Because he's such an extreme, like, 100 miles a minute brain. 
of a comedian. It's like he's from another planet. So he's playing more from work. It fits his personality because it's like, what are you? How do you do this? And in Jumanji, that movie, he's this guy coming out of the game. He's been in the jungle for 20 years, barely surviving, and he's insane. And it works because that's like right in his lane because he's got some insanity to him, you know? That's what makes him so exciting as a performer. And that's why Jumanji, the first one, kicks so much ass is because you got Robin Williams at the peak of his powers and the perfect role for him, you know? So we get an opportunity to revisit Jumanji. It's a big title, big shoes to fill, but it's a great take. The script is, is uh, electric. And what's really the best thing about it is reading it, knowing that you've got Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Kevin Hart in those roles. It was like, those guys are gonna be hilarious. I could just see it. I heard their voices while I'm reading it. You're telling me that you're Spencer. I am Spencer, I'm Spencer. Ah! Yep, that's Spencer. And they're offering me the role to be the most popular girl in school. And I was like, I know how to be the hot chick from high school. I know for some reason, I know how to do it. <gasps> oh my God, you guys, there's like literally a penis attached to my body right now. Martha, come look at my penis. And it was just like, I hope I get this part. I mean, I know I've been offered the part, but it feels too good to be true. Like at the last minute, I'm but I, I, I got it, I kept it, and, and we made it. And just as I had anticipated, <laughs> Grand Slam home run, felt good. Feels good to connect. Do you have a lot of fun playing that hot chick character? I don't know, I mean, it's just, you know, like it comes natural. The fact that I'm not Instagramming this right now is insane. Here's the thing funny. about Jumanji though. Yeah. Here's the thing about Jumanji. Welcome to the Jungle. And it was something that I realized that we were bringing to the table because the first Jumanji, it's this little kid plays Jumanji, the board game, and gets sucked into the game. You don't see him cut to 20 years later, he comes out of the game and he's like, the jungle, I've been in the jungle. But you never see what he saw for those 20 years. But in our movie, you're going into the game. You're going into the jungle. I think we, we got like sucked into the game. And I was pushing early on. I hate to toot my own horn, but I basically named the movie because I was like, you guys, that's the difference. This movie is, we're in the jungle. It should be called Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle. And one of the marketing dudes was like, huh, you know, Jack's got a point there. Anyway, now I feel, I feel dirty for having taken credit for the naming of the movie, but it's true. Jumanji, the next level. Uh, Jumanji, the next level is all about the new elements. Danny DeVito, Danny Glover, Kevin and Dwayne playing those new old characters. It's so perfect. And it really is my favorite part of the movie are these new elements because they kick so much ass. And Dwayne and Kevin, are perfectly suited to those roles because they are bickering old farts. You know what I mean? They fight each other all the time, but they love each other. But they hate each other, but they love each other. And it's perfect. And I think that's what Jake and the writers were thinking. They were like, how can we capitalize on this insane relationship that they have? And how could we use that and harness it? And yeah, it's bickering old dudes uh, that have this love for each other. And of course, you know, we got Aquafina in there and she's a dynamo. She's incredibly funny, talented character actress. Those were the things I was most excited about. The, 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 the trio of new rocket sauce. My part, I got to play a new character and I was scared about it and I was like, this is, uh, this is gonna be a real challenge. I don't know if I can pull it off. And uh, you know, I had the same fears and concerns with Nacho Libre, I was like, I don't know if I should play this part. There's, if there's a spice in there if I, if I get it wrong. But I felt really good about my performance. I felt like I, I really found the voice and the character. And I was really proud at the end of the day uh, what I was able to come up with. I'm excited for people to see it.